Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and I have Chris Gethin and we are talking all about how to get thin. We were joking right before I got on here, his last name is uh, spelled G-E-T-H-I-N. So it's kind of like, it's meant to be if you want to get thin, you call Chris Gethin. (laughs) So Chris, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. So one of the things that you are really great at is just transforming people's bodies. And the people listening on this show, a lot of them are kind of in a rut right now. And they might be like, you know, I want to lose, you know, some weight. Maybe they've done intermittent fasting. They've lost 20, 30 pounds doing it. And they still want to lose that last 10 or 20 pounds. I want us to really dive in on what are some of the things that you see people doing wrong where they don't even, it's almost like they're blinded to it. You know what I mean? They come to you and they're like, but I'm doing everything right. I don't understand. Why am I not losing weight? I want you to kind of talk about the top five things where you you can see it so plain as day, but they're kind of like blinded to it. Yeah, good question. So firstly, you know, I, I think this this might be quite obvious to your listeners, but, um, you know, it's the hidden calories that add up. You know, some people, they'll go and have like double creamer in their coffee. They'll have a bit of a snack here and there. They may purchase something that is quote unquote fat free, but laden in sugar and vice versa. If it's low fat, maybe it's got, uh, uh, sorry, if it's low sugar, it's got a lot of fat. So it's a lot of hidden things where people just snack on, maybe it's a handful of nuts throughout the day. And then all of a sudden, they're like seven, eight hundred calories over their baseline or over in order to, you know, to burn fat. That's the one thing. The other thing is a little bit more psychological, you know, because at the end of the day, we, you know, we can blame it on our genetics, our hereditary disposition. It's where we live, the season that we're in, whatever. But it comes down to the environmental factor inside our head, not surrounding us, because of course, we go to the checkout counter. We've got food there. We go to Starbucks. There's, you know, the Starbucks are sometimes hidden coffees that are really like 800 calories. So we have those environmental factors, but the environmental factor inside our brain is the one that we really need to control because that's the battle. That's half the battle. So I always say to people, and, you know, we know this that motivation can fail you. You may wake up tired, fatigued. You've had an argument with your spouse, and then you're going to, go to some type of food that is comforting and that's usually calorie laden. So what can we do to create that discipline out of that motivation? Because the discipline will be there every day. The motivation will fluctuate. So I will always say to a client, okay, so let's look at your lifestyle. What time are you going to bed? That's super late. Let's create a form of discipline by going to bed earlier. And then we're going to wake up in the morning without hitting a snooze button. That's another form of discipline. Maybe we're going to have a cold shower instead of a warm shower, another form of discipline. If it's raining outside, lace up, let's go for a walk, okay? And then when you start stacking these little wins together, then you're going to be a little bit more disciplined when you go to, um, you know, like a party, a social gathering to say no, because you've started compounding this discipline within you and you're creating new neurons to say no, as opposed to giving in. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. I think I mean, that... I, I, is it one guys... thing, and I'm just thinking of this right now because I'm walking on my desktop treadmill here. I think we, a lot of us fall into the trap that, okay, if I just do 20 minutes of cardio, I go to the gym for 40 minutes, that's enough. Now, our ancestors didn't do that. There was no, no such thing as CrossFit boxes or gyms or any type of facilities, but we moved a lot. If you look at the blue zones today, they move a lot. In some of those blue zones, there isn't a word in their language where people live to a disproportionate age. And just by the way, if your listeners do not know what blue zones are, people who lived to be like over 100 years old, centenarians, but in good health. And they're very active. They're active all day. You know, they've noticed that in some of these uh, villages that these pockets of blue zones reside, they live on very steep hills. So they're constantly walking up and down. In a place like Okinawa, the older generation didn't sit in seats. They still sit on the floor and they've observed that they will stand and sit around 50 times per day 
And these people are over 100 years old. That's their resistance training that is obviously creating more muscle, which is more metabolically active, and more uh, bone density. So they live longer, healthier. So I think it's very important that we remain active throughout the day, especially after a meal. If we have a meal and that causes, that can cause a blood sugar spike, we do some type of movement. Go for a 10 minute walk, maybe stand and sit down 50 times at your desk. This can maintain a much more stabilized blood sugar levels throughout the day. And of course, you're going to burn off more calories. I don't know about you guys, but I am stressed. And if you're feeling overwhelmed this holiday season, then I get it. With all the family get togethers, it is just a relentless source of stress. But anyway, there is something that I've got called Stress Guardian. And it's actually made by Bioptimizers, the people who make the magnesium breakthrough, which I love, love, love. But anyway, they are literally made this new product. It has 14 adaptogenic herbs and it just regulates your stress. I just actually took some right this second. And it's awesome. If you go to stressguardian.com slash waste away and put in waste away for 10% off your first order, it's stressguardian.com slash waste away. Go there now. Yeah, and I think I want to kind of break it down. Like, number one, I think that people are eating too much and eating, like you said in the beginning, eating too many calories and they just don't realize it because part of it is that they're eating too fast. And I know that's a problem that I have is that I still eat too fast. And so then I'm eating too much because I haven't slowed down long enough and, you know, involving slowing down, eating without distraction, savoring my food, enjoying every bite, and then listening to the natural signals that tell your brain, okay, she's had enough food now because there's study after study showing that people who eat slower and more mindful you're going to feel full sooner and that's going to pr promote long-term weight loss. Do you agree? 100%. I'm sure, I don't know if you've read the book called The Slow Down Diet, which talks all about that in depth with a lot of studies that do support that because we should be in that what's called parasympathetic state, which is rest and digest by taking things slowly relaxing, eating, like you said, without distractions, scrolling on a phone, watching a screen, and savior, like you said, that texture, the smell, the taste, the sight of that food. Appreciate, you know, what that food went through to get on your plate and appreciate that. Putting your fork down between bites to ensure that, then you said, you know, I think studies show that it takes about 20 minutes to signal to your brain, I am full. Well, if you wolfed everything down within 10 minutes, you're possibly going to wolf down double the amount then over the next following 10 minutes. So that's 100%. And as you mentioned about a lot of these hidden calories as well, not only do we have these hidden calories that you know we kind of snack on, we don't really realize until we're 500, 800 calories over every single day, then you have to look at the inflammatory response of some of those ingredients as well. Of course, if we're getting processed foods, maybe it's laden with antibiotics and you know there's a lot of hidden ingredients that we can't even pronounce so how our body is going to recognize it i don't know and then you've got your refined vegetable oils etc cetera, etc cetera, a lot of sugar so your body is in an inflamed state which isn't allowing it to be as metabolically active and healthy as it could be to burn off those calories did you guys know that your thyroid's main food is iodine and guess what mercury and other toxins gobble up your selenium and your thyroid glands need selenium to convert iodine to thyroxine. So if you have mercury fillings and with all the toxins and mold, your selenium gets, just gets gobbled up. So here's the bottom line. I take something called peak thyroid. It's got iodine, it's got copper, and it's got selenium. Everything you need to get your thyroid back to functioning without medicine. So go to ChantelRayWay.com slash upgraded formulas. Use the coupon code ChantelRay to get a huge discount. Let's talk about, so yeah, so all the reasons. Number one, you're eating too much. Number two, you're eating too fast. What about not eating enough 
protein because protein is an important nutrient for losing weight and it does help you feel fuller longer. Uh, talk about people that you've seen who they've just switched to adding more protein in their diet and how that's helped with weight loss. Yeah, because, you know, protein is an important factor. These amino acids help with our skin, our hair, our eyesight, our connected tissue, et cetera. But it also helps maintain muscle mass and it can create fullness as well. And that is a low, you know, like if you compare it to say uh, fats, for instance, you've got nine calories per gram. You've only got four calories as well. And the body will maintain a lot of those calories to maintain the muscle as well. The muscle is metabolically active. So you can burn off many more calories just stationary than somebody who doesn't have equal amounts of muscle. It doesn't have to be like huge bodybuilding style muscle. It can be just muscle density that creates that metabolically active signal 24 seven. So I'm not saying go out and have a cheat meal, but for instance, if I was to have a cheat meal compared to somebody who has less muscle than I and has that same cheat meal, I'm gonna burn off many more being stationary than that person because my muscle will require it just to maintain it. So, you know, it's very important that you do start with your protein. And I always like to start with protein first on the dish. So if, it, if there's no protein in it, I don't count it as a meal. It's not counted. From a client, if a client shows me, okay, I had five meals today. I say, well, you actually only had three because two didn't have protein. It's very important to start with a form of protein. And then if you eat the protein first off your plate, and then maybe your fats and then your carbohydrates, you'll have less of a blood sugar spike. I know we're getting into the weeds here. It's not part of the basics, but it does happen. Much like, you know, if you eat up, you know, like uh, white rice, for instance, let it cool, eat, eat it again if you wanted to. But if you let it cool, it creates more insulin uh, rich star starch. The starch is more resistant. So you don't get as much of a blood sugar spike then as well. But the protein, like you said, is a very important factor, again, to create that fullness so you don't overeat in the carbs or fats. You know, one thing that I, I want to just <clears throat> tell people about how to putting the food down that helps me, because one area that I don't know why, I mean, I like tell people this and help teach them but I personally, just to be honest, have a really hard time with slowing down on my eating. So what I have to do um, is that I have to take my food sometimes. And so I'll eat, like right before this call, I had a little bit of food and I just ate a little bit and then I put it aside and then I got ready for this call. And then now I'm not going to eat again for 30 minutes. And then I can finish eating whatever it is. You, you don't have to go 30 minutes. But to kind of like wait, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes and put the food aside and then go back to it. Because if I'm not going to slow down my eating to the point where, I mean, really experts will say, like you should be chewing that food until it liquefies in your mouth. And if if you're, I mean, I, that's the ultimate goal, but I'm saying if you're not going to do that and you're having trouble doing that, just having a little bit and then walking away and then going back to eating whatever it is. When I interviewed, in, in my books, I interviewed a bunch of women and a bunch of them did that. Like they would eat a little bit even though they would eat it slow and then they would turn around and just put the food aside. I remember interviewing a girl and she literally, the waitress must have come back about four times because she thought she was done. So she pushed the food away. This is a thin eater, someone who's been thin their whole life. She pushed the food away and the waitress came back and she's like, can I take that? And she's like, no, I'm still going to graze on it. So maybe like four or five minutes later, you know, the girl comes back. She's like, are you done with that yet? And she's like, no, I'm, I'm still going to graze on it. She did that like four times. And it just shows you that people who are thin and people who have a handle on their weight, 
they do understand this idea that it takes 20 to 30 minutes for your brain to realize that you're full. And that is such an important piece. And so I just want to really stress that to people out there right now. If you're not going to slow down, you know, it's really hard for you, at least take a break. That will be a really good, good piece for you. So we talked about not eating enough protein. Um, Let's kind of expand on the not exercising enough. If you guys uh, are watching this podcast, you'll see that he is actually on a treadmill right now and walking while we're talking. So Chris is actually, he's got his microphone there. He's on a treadmill. So talk about like people just thinking that they're exercising, maybe just going to the gym for 30 minutes that morning. And then that's all they're doing. And in their mind, they're like, oh, I went to the gym this morning for 30 minutes, but they're still not exercising enough. Yeah, I guess it all depends on the job as well. Like I have a sedentary job, really. You know, I, I spend a lot of time working from home if I'm not traveling, but I'm usually in front of the computer. So, you know, if you've got a, a manual arduous job, then okay, that's fine. You're moving around. I have some clients that get 20,000 steps a day because they work in a warehouse, for instance, and they're just getting in a, a, a lot of steps. But for me, I'm sat on my butt, and a lot of my clients are sat on their butt. They could be drivers, they could be office workers, they could be traveling a lot in planes. So I, I find that it's very important to keep moving then. If we have better blood flow, nutrient-rich blood and oxygen-rich blood that's reaching our muscles, that's reaching our brain, that is going to fulfill us, and we're going to be that much more, I guess, impactful and active because of it. So, for instance, if I've got a, if I'm on a flight, or if I've got a client on a flight, every 30 minutes, if they're awake and they're not sleeping, I'll say, "Hey, I want you to take an aisle seat when you're on this flight, and I want you to go to the toilet every 30 minutes and do like 50 um, uh, toilet squats." You know, so you've always got some movement because obviously you're in a pressurized cabin, you've got recycled air. You know, the blood can clot or it can thicken. So, I think it's very important to stay hydrated and actually move. But the reason, like I've got, I've got a proper desktop treadmill here because I have a sedentary job. So it's very important for me to be active. Now, I also eat larger meals as well. You know, they're healthy meals. So I want to make sure that I'm regulating my blood sugar stability as well because I don't want to be low in energy when I get a crash. And I don't want to have such a huge insulin spike where I'm going to gain fat. So that is the importance of movement constantly. And of course, it's great for my bone density. It's great for my synovial fluid, which is the lubricant to my joints. And it's great to get blood flow to my brain so I can be a little bit more cogn cognizant uh, of, of, of my tasks that I'm going to get done throughout the day. If I'm not active, I find I'm just not as productive. So uh, the, you know that's, that's the main reason why I suggest it to clients as well. And it's good for your heart health, you know. Of course, you know, I can talk about building your pecs and your abs and whatnot, but, our, you know, the most important muscle is our heart. So it's very important that we work that too. And the other thing that I just wanted to say, if we're still talking about additional tip, the one thing I have clients from around the world and in some pockets of the world, they go to bed exceptionally late. And I find the longer that some clients stay up in the evening, the, the likelihood of them to cheat is much higher. Now they're at home, they're designed to relax. Now they kind of want a little bit more comforting and they're becoming fatigued. When you become fatigued, you're not necessarily going to make the right choices for yourself. That's why people usually wake up the next day and go, oh my God, why did I eat that? Because you were tired, you know, you wasn't of right mind. So I always try to get my clients to really focus on their sleep, the quality of their sleep, switching off the device an hour before bed, switching off all electrical devices so you don't get that dopamine fix. And of course, you don't get a lot of the artificial light. So I don't know if you could see the light bulb behind me. I'm not saying that everyone should do this, but I have red bulbs. This looks like a brothel in my house because I don't want the flicker from the artificial blue light that is going to raise my cortisol levels. So the only time I'll allow my cortisol levels to spike is when I go to the gym. The rest of the time, like I said, I want to be in that parasympathetic state. Guys, I just want to interrupt for just a second, and I want you to hear Paul Saladino talk about why liver is so important. And if you don't like liver, we have another option for you. 
your ancestors were eating liver. And the reason that this sort of wisdom has been passed down is because liver is very nutritious. It's basically nature's multivitamin. If you look at the nutrients in meat, they're great. You've got zinc, you got B6, you got B12, you got some K2. But if you look at liver, it really complements what's in muscle meat. And there are many unique nutrients found in organs, specifically liver as a powerhouse of these, that are difficult to obtain outside of liver. Like meat and organs are like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. They're supposed to be eaten together. The easiest way to eat liver is just to do it raw. If you don't want to eat liver raw, you can cook it. But the reason that I like to do it raw is because there are unique nutrients in liver that are probably somewhat degraded when you cook the liver. This really is like the most nutrient rich supplements that you can find. And they are amazing. I have tried them. I absolutely love them. So just go to heartandsoil.co, use the coupon code Chantal Ray and save you some money there. So I also want to talk about people <clears throat> eating too often. And so, you know, a lot of times people who are bodybuilders, you know, they suggest that everyone eats so many meals per day to boost their metabolism and lose weight. And then they're just eating, again, too much food. You know, they're starting at 6 a.m. and then going to you know, each meal and it's like every two hours they're eating. Talk about that. Yeah. So the reason being is that because obviously bodybuilders are training exceptionally hard. They're breaking down a lot of muscle tissue. The only way, let's say if they trained on a Monday, the only way that they're going to go into the gym and train at, you know, perfect performance, 100% performance on the following day, on the Tuesday, is if they have fully recovered from the previous day of breaking down that muscle tissue. The only way that they're going to do that is by, of course, taking in the carbohydrates needed to give you energy for the workout, to take in the amount of protein required to recover from the workout, you know, help repair the damaged muscle tissue, and of course, healthy fats for hormonal production. Now, there's only so much food that the body will be able to absorb in one sitting. You know, everyone's got to be different, obviously. So then we try to space out the meals like every three hours, something like that. So they're constantly having a supply of amino acids, little pockets of glycogen without creating huge spikes and then, uh, you know, low crashes. So, and we're trying to signal what's called the mTOR, mTOR activation, which you're going to get from, you know, protein every, every so many meals. You'll get it from carbohydrates as well. And then basically their only fasting window is when they sleep. Now I get all of my clients that are athletic performers or bodybuilders or whatever is to fast on their non-training days because here they are signaling mTOR, mTOR, mTOR. But we need to signal another pathway called AMPK, which are only going to signal through fasting. And of course, then we want the DNA cleanup, which is like a deep clean for your house through autophagy, which you're going to get through fasting as well. So it's obviously a lot of stress put on the digestive system by getting a lot of food. So now we need to balance it out a little bit. So what I find with a lot of people that eat a lot of muscle meat, they overdo something called methionine. And that's what can lead to the onset of early aging. Your biological age increases, even though your chronological age may be, say, I'm 49, but my biological age is actually 26. But a lot of athletic performers' biological age is much older than their chronological age. And that's because they're eating methionine, methionine, methionine. Well, this is one of the contributors, I should say. And that's a lot of muscle meat. Our ancestors used to, used to eat nose to tail. So they were getting a lot of glycine. Now, not everybody is going to go out and eat liver or kidney or anything like that. So then I would suggest, okay, you could supplement with glycine or you can take collagen supplements or something along those lines. And so you're actually getting a good balance there. So yeah, there's an unhealthy way of doing it, but there's a healthier way of doing it as well. And I try to balance it out with both because a lot of these people come to me with aesthetic goals, but I'm trying to give them longevity and health span goals at the same time. So that's why I always intertwine with fasting. Like I do a lot of fasting. I've done five-day fasts. Five-day fast didn't really work for me, but I had to try it in order to relate to it. But I find like an 18-hour fast is usually the perfect for myself. 
Did you guys know that 97% of Americans are deficient in at least one mineral? It's true. You need more than a dozen minerals for your body to function in its best, but with the standard American diet, it's almost impossible. So here's where B minerals comes in. Guess what? All you have to do, take one little shot of this one, one little shot of this one, and guess what? It looks like this, but it tastes like water. Take one shot, and boom, in 30 seconds a day, you're getting an entire thing of minerals instead of an entire cabinet of supplement bottles. So with Beam Minerals, we make mineral balance simple. Talk about biohacking a little bit. I want you to kind of talk about any little biohacking tricks that you kind of implemented. You already kind of talked about the red light. Do you do any cold plunges or any other things that you have felt like have been a biohacking tip for weight loss or just longevity? Yeah. So actually part of my college qualifications uh, in the, this is in the mid nineties now was a uh, contrast therapy, which included heat, heat therapy and cold therapy. So yes, yeah, so I've had a, uh, an ice bath in my backyard for about eight or nine years now. Well, yeah, maybe about eight years. So yeah, I jump in that every morning. I've got a sauna that I jump in as well, because of course there's a lot of, uh, pollutants that we have in our food supply, in our fluid supply, in our air supply, even like the hygiene supplies that we put on, you know? So want to make sure that I detox through that. And then with a the cold thermogenesis, I get a lot of my clients to do that, such as ice baths, because I just find it it creates, especially when people do it in the morning, it creates more emotional stability. Of course, it can help with the mobilization of fatty acids. It can help with inflammation. But I find the most benefit that most people get from it, because it, you know, if you've got your neck submerged, it will tone your vagal nerve, which takes you from that fight or flight response. So it gives you more emotional stability. Um, as far as other biohacks, like I said, I've got, you know, these uh, uh, low flicker and low EMF light bulbs. I have EMF, um, you know, people do think it's a little bit woo woo, but I do have like the EMF mitigators uh, throughout my house. Now I don't do as many biohacks here as there, unless, you know, as much as I do when I'm traveling. So if I'm, in, if I'm in Vegas or if I'm in London or New York or Mumbai, for instance, then I'll find that I have to do more biohacks there to ensure that my heart rate variability is more stable. So, you know, I'll, I'll earth myself and ground myself a couple of times a day, but I use, I use, okay, that's our ancestors with our ancestors wisdom there. Okay. Take our shoes and socks off, but I'll biohack my environment. So I have trainers that are grounding that earthing so every time i walk outside i'm earthing and grounding so that would be like a bio pack for instance but there's a lot of them you know i'm actually going to get stem cells uh next week um so you know it all depends how far down the rabbit hole that we want to go but what i've been doing every single year and i'll get my biological age test you can do it through uh, glycans you could do it through telomeres you can do it through methylation my biological age is reduced every single year by doing it. Now, some people say, oh, it's a little bit obsessive, but I enjoy it. You know, it's part of what I do and what I teach other people. So I'm going to use myself as a bit of a guinea pig with calculated risks. I like that. Um, so tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Sure. Uh, I think the best thing is if anybody wanted to reach out or follow me is just go to my Instagram, which is K-R-I-S, Chris Gethin, G-E-T-H-I-N. I love it. Well, you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.